Hello, welcome everyone. I am so happy to see you all here today. What an auspicious occasion. Uh, thank you for coming together to celebrate the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And so after I thank all of you, of course I have some other people to thank. Um, first I want to thank Michaela Sims. I know she's here, I saw her. <laughs> oh, there she is, way in the back. So Michaela suggested this program three years ago, the, the MLK Speak Out, and um, she suggested about three weeks before we would have done it, <laughs> at which I loved because, you know, that's the way I work too. So, um, and I thank her so much because it's just become a real signature event for Brooks Memorial Library. And the reason it was able to become such a big event is through the help of Brattleboro Solidarity. So how many Solidarity people do we have in the audience today? A bunch, yes. And so thanks to Brattleboro Solidarity who supported this from the very beginning. Um, also, thank you to the Community Equity Collaborative of the Brattleboro area who supports this work throughout the community every day. So I'm so grateful to be a part of them. Uh, and of course, thank you to your friends and mine, the friends of the Brooks Memorial Library. And because Brattleboro Solidarity is involved, there will be soup afterwards. And uh, so I invite everyone to stay and um, travel upstairs to the community meeting room for a community supper of soup and breadsticks thanks to the Brattleboro Retreat. And so, without further ado... Oh. Eagles, one of them big, ugly, orange Montgomery buses, Coretta. I know it's five o'clock in the morning and a daughter Yoki sleeping, but there was nobody in the bus. Miss Robinson worked hard, but she couldn't have got them 50,000 flies out to all the Negroes in Montgomery for that bus boycott. I know that first bus was empty because it was the first one of the morning. Here comes another bus, Coretta. I know there's gonna be people in there. <coughs> there's two people in there, Coretta. <coughs> but they what? One day after finishing school, I was called to a little church down in Montgomery, Alabama. And I started preaching there. Things were going well in that church. It was a marvelous experience. One day, a year later, a lady by the name of Rosa Parks decided that she wasn't going to take it any longer. She stayed in a bus seat. Now, you may not remember it because it's way back now, several years, but it was the beginning of the movement where 50,000 black men and women refused absolutely to ride the city buses and we walked together for 381 days. That's what we got to learn in the North. Negroes have to learn to stick together. We stuck together. We sent out the call. No Negro rode the buses. It was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my life. Then the people of Montgomery asked me to serve as their spokesperson. And as the president of the new organization, the Montgomery Improvement Association that came into being to lead the boycott, I couldn't say no. Then we started our struggle together. Things were going well for the first few days, but then about 10 or 15 days later after the war, people in Montgomery knew that we meant this. They started doing some nasty things. They started making nasty telephone calls and came to the point that some days more than 40 telephone calls would come in, threatening my life, the life of my family, the life of my children. I took it for a while in a strong manner, but I never will forget it. One night it was very late. It was around midnight. You can have some strange experiences at midnight. 
I'd been out meeting with the steering committee all that night. I came home. My wife was in the bed and I immediately crawled into bed to try to get some rest to get up early the next morning to try to keep things going and immediately the telephone started ringing and I, I picked it up. On the other end was an ugly voice. That voice said to me in substance, nigger, we're tired of you and your mess now. If you aren't out of this town in three days, we're going to blow your brains out and blow up your house. Now, I've heard these things before, but for some reason that night it got to me. I turned over and I tried to go to sleep, but I, I couldn't sleep. Frustrated. Bewildered. Then I got up and I, I went into the kitchen and I started warming some coffee, thinking that coffee would give me a little relief. And I started thinking about many things. I pulled back on the theology and philosophy that I just studied in the university, trying to give philosophical and theological reason for the existence and the reality of sin and evil, but the answer didn't quite come there. I sat there and thought about a beautiful little daughter who had just been born about a month earlier. She was the darling of my life. I'd come in night after night and see that little gentle smile and I I sat at that table thinking about that little girl and thinking about the fact that she could be taken away from me any minute now. I started thinking about a dedicated, devoted, and loyal wife who was over there sleeping. She could be taken from me, I could be taken from her, and I, I got to the point that I couldn't take it any longer. I was weak. Something said to me, you can't call on Daddy now. He's up in Atlanta, 175 miles away. Can you? Call on mama now. You got to call on that something and that person that your daddy used to tell you about. That power that could make a way out of no way. I discovered then that religion hadn't become real to me and I had to know God for myself. So I bowed down over that cup of coffee. I never will forget it. Oh yes, I prayed a prayer and I prayed out loud, loud that night. I said, Lord, I'm down here trying to do what's right. I think I'm right. I think the cause that we represent is right, but Lord, I must confess that I'm weak now, I'm faltering, I'm losing my courage. It seemed at that moment that I could hear an inner voice saying to me, Martin Luther, stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. And lo, I will be with you, even until the end of the world. I tell you, I've seen the lightning flash. And I've heard the thunder roll, and I felt sin breakers dashing, trying to conquer my soul. But I heard the voice of Jesus mm. saying, still, to fight on, he promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. Sometimes I, I feel discouraged. I don't mind telling you this afternoon, sometimes I, I feel discouraged. I felt discouraged in Chicago. As I moved through Mississippi and Georgia and Alabama, I feel discouraged sometimes. Living every day under the threat of death, I feel discouraged sometimes. Living every day under extensive criticism, even from Negroes, I feel discouraged sometimes. Yes, sometimes I feel discouraged and feel my works in vain. But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin sick souls. God bless you. The great challenge that we face is to be ready to enter these doors when they open. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Ralph Waldo Emerson said in a lecture back in 1871 that if a man can write a better book or preach a better sermon or make a better mousetrap than his neighbor, even if he builds his house in the woods, the world will make a beaten path to his door. This will become increasingly true. 
Now it means that we're going to have to work hard. We're going to have to burn the midnight oil sometime. We're going to have to take advantage of new opportunities. We must set out to do our life's work so well that nobody could do it better. We must set out to do a good job. We must not seek merely to do a good Negro job. If you're setting out merely to be a good Negro doctor, a good Negro lawyer, a good Negro teacher, a good Negro preacher, a good Negro skilled labor, a good Negro barber, a good Negro beautician, you have already flunked your matriculation exam for entrance into the University of Integration. This is it. We must set out to do a good job and to do that job so well that the living, the dead, or the unborn couldn't do it better. As I've said so often, if it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, go on out and sweep streets like Michelangelo carved marble, sweep streets like Raphael painted pictures, sweep streets like Beethoven composed music, and like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep street so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept her job well. This is it. If you can't be a pond on the top of the hill, be a scrub in the valley, but be the best little scrub on the side of the reel. Be the bush if you can't be the tree. If you can't be the highway, just be the trail. If you can't be the sun, be a star, for it isn't by stars that you win or you fail. Be the best of whatever you are. Hey, Yogi, give me some sugar, wooga, wooga, wooga. Where's mommy sugar, wooga, wooga? Where's bunny sugar, wooga, wooga? Where's Dexter sugar, wooga, wooga? Where's Marty sugar, wooga, wooga, wooga? Yoki ain't got no sugar. <laughs> you sold a TV commercial for Fun Town, and now you know you're tall enough to go on all the rides like the bumper cars and the carousels. Of course, Daddy won't take you. I didn't the only reason some people can't go, Yogi. Did, did, did you notice anything about the people in that TV commercial for Fun Town? Look at Marty's hands. What do you notice about Marty's hands? He lied and didn't wash up. I'm gonna get you for that, Smarty Marty Pants. What else do you notice about Marty's hands? Look at this side of Marty's hands. It, it's pretty pink, right? And look at this side of Marty's hands. It's, it's pretty brown, right? Well, did you notice anything about the people in that TV commercial for Fun Town? They, 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 they all look like this side of Marty's hand. Now, we're all God's children. He made some brown, some red, some yellow, some black, and some white. And the, and the people who made Fun Town, uh, it, it does not mean that you're not as good as those people, Yogi. Don't cry, you. That's why daddy's out there working. He wants you to go to Fun Town. Yoki! Yoki! My dear fellow clergymen, while confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling my present activities unwise and untimely. <coughs> Since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and that your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I want to try to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. 
You deplore the demonstrations taking place in Birmingham, but your statement, I'm sorry to say, fails to express a similar concern for the conditions which brought about the demonstrations. Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Its ugly record of brutality is widely known. There have been more unsolved bombings of Negro homes and churches in Birmingham than in any other city in the nation. These are the hard, brutal facts of the case. You may well ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches, and so forth? Isn't negotiation a better path? Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. You speak of our activity in Birmingham as extreme. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? Love your enemy, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice or for the extension of justice? When you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, and you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park and See her developing an unconscious bitterness toward white people? And you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who's asking, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored, when your first name becomes nigger and your middle name becomes boy, how old you are, and your last name becomes John, and your wife and mother are never given the respected title missus, when you are hired by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro living constantly at tiptoe stands, never quite knowing what to expect next and are plagued with inner fears and outer resentment, when you are forever fighting a degrading and degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. <coughs> you assert that our actions, even though peaceful, must be condemned. Isn't this like condemning Jesus because his unique God consciousness and never ceasing devotion to God's will precipitated the evil act of crucifixion? I have no despair about the future. <laughs> I have no fear about the outcome of our struggle in Birmingham, even if our motives are at present misunderstood. We shall reach the goal of freedom in Birmingham and all over the nation, because the goal of America is freedom. We shall win our freedom because the sacred heritage of this nation and the eternal will of the Almighty God are embodied in our echoing demands. I'm happy to join with you today 
in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro steel is not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. One hundred years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. One hundred years later, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. So we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall there. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. But we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation. So we've come to cast this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. We have also come to this hallowed spot to remind America of the fierce urgency of now. This is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualness. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit paths of racial justice. Now is the time to lift our nation from the quicksands of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. It would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment. This sweltering winter of the Negro's legitimate discontent will not pass until there is an invigorating autumn of freedom and equality. 1963 is not an end, but a beginning. Those who hoped that the Negro needed to blow off steam and will now be content will have a rude awakening if the nation returns to business as usual. There will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship rock. The whirlwinds of revolt will continue to shake the foundations of our nation until the bright day of justice emerges. There is something that I must say to my people who stand on the warm threshold which leads into the palace of justice. In the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. We must forever conduct our struggle on the high plane of dignity and discipline. We must not allow our creative protests to degenerate into physical bars. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force 
with soul force. The marvelous new militancy, which has engulfed the Negro community, must not lead us to a distrust of all white people. For many of our white brethren, as evidenced by their presence here today, have come to realize that their destiny is tied up with our destiny. They've come to realize that their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. We cannot walk alone. And as we walk, we must make the pledge that we shall always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the vic victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our body is heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the cities. We cannot be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and the Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, we are not satisfied and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. I'm not my unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you come fresh from narrow jail cells. Some of you come from areas where your quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering. Continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi. Go back to Alabama, go back to South Carolina, go back to Georgia, go back to Louisiana, go back to the slums and ghettos of our northern cities, knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, that even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners Will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream today. I have a dream that my four little children one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day, down in Alabama with its vicious racist, with its governor having his lips stripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls We'll be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls and sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. Every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain and the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. This is all. This is the faith that I go back to the south with. With this faith. We will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day. This will be the day when all of God's children 
will be able to sing with new meaning. My country, tis of thee. Sweet land of liberty of thee I sing, land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrims, pride from every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America's to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the hiking Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. Not only that. Let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring, and when this happens, when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing the words of the old Negro spiritual. Free at last, free at last. Thank God, Almighty, we're free at last. Yellow bricks to the 16th Street Baptist Church can speak. What would they say this morning? Would they ask for forgiveness? Forgiveness does not mean forgetting the sin, but forgiving the sinner. Cynthia Wesley, Denise McNair, Addie Mae Collins, and Carol Roberts killed in this church in the height of life by praising God. Seems like the dream I spoke about just, just 18 days ago has turned into a nightmare. Like that poet Langston Hughes, I, I do wonder what happens to a dream deferred. I must admit, Mr. Gaskin, that I sometimes wonder if I have underestimated the depth of hate in white America. I couldn't sleep last night. Thinking about these four little girls, thinking about the fact that it could have been my little girl, it almost was. I know Mr. Gaston, you asked me to stay away and what a price to pay. But I want to ask us to pray this afternoon. Pray for the souls of these, these four little girls. Pray that the hate that might be in our hearts could turn to love. Like in one together. Come on, everybody. We shall overcome someday. How long? Some way I read about the freedom of assembly. Some way I read about the freedom of speech. Some way I read about the freedom of the press. Some way I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for your rights. Some years ago, I was in New York, autographing my first book, when a demented black woman approached and asked, 
are you Dr. King? I said yes without looking up. And I felt this pounding on my chest. For I knew it. I had been stabbed. I was rushed to Harlem Hospital. X-rays revealed that the tip of the blade was on the edge of my aorta. If it had punctured, I would have drowned in my own blood. The New York Times headlines a few days later read that if I had sneezed, I would have died. I received kind mail from the president, uh, the vice president, and the governor who, who also visited. All these telegrams I had forgotten. But I got one note from a student at the White Plains High School. It read, Dear Dr. King, I'm a ninth grader. And while it should not matter, I would like to mention that I'm a white girl. I read of your misfortune how if you had sneezed, you would have died. Well, I just wanted to write to say to you that I'm so happy you did not sneeze. <laughs> and I'd like to share with all of you this afternoon that I too am so happy I did not sneeze. For if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around in 1960 when students all over the South sat in at lunch counters. While they were sitting in, they were standing up for democracy. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around in 1962 when Negroes in Albany, Georgia straightened their backs and started going somewhere. And when a person straightens their back, a man can't ride it because it's no longer bent. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around in 1963 when blacks in Birmingham, Alabama raised the conscience of a nation and helped to usher in the Civil Rights Bill. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around a few months later to tell America about a dream I'd had. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been in Memphis to see a community rally around sisters and brothers who were struggling. So I'd just like to say to you all again this afternoon, and I'm so happy I did not sneeze. <laughs> then I got back to Memphis, started to hear about the threats, about the rumors that were out, about what might happen to me from some of our sick white brothers. I don't know what'll happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter with me now, because I've been to the mountaintop. Now, I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a, a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to that mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. And I may not get there with you. But I want you to know today that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. All you're doing is running from fire to fire, blowing on another man's flames, brother. Rioting is not revolutionary. I know this is not Birmingham or, 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 or Selma, but we cannot allow rage to replace reason. Like power? You don't want to be like Bob? Well, by throwing that Molotov cocktail, you, you are imitating some of the most uncivilized aspects of American law. And if we live an eye for an eye, brother, we, we'll all end up blind. You say you served in Nam and, and, and you've been out of work for a year? Well, well is throwing a Molotov cocktail at the factory going to help you get a job? You want to overthrow the government. That argument will not work here in America because we will be living tomorrow with the same people we're struggling against today. This is not Africa or India. Please give me the Molotov, brother. I preach to you today on the war in Vietnam because my conscience leaves me with no other choice 
We shall know the truth, says Jesus, and the truth shall set you free. I agree with Dante that the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in a period of moral crisis maintain their neutrality. There comes a time when silence is betrayal. So we must stand and we must speak and we must rejoice as well for in all our history there has never been such a monumental dissent during a war by the American people. Polls reveal that almost 50 million Americans explicitly opposed the war in Vietnam. Additional millions cannot bring themselves around to support it. But there are those who are seeking to equate dissent with disloyalty. Over the past few years, as I have moved to break the betrayal of my own silences, as I have called for radical departures from the destruction of Vietnam, many persons have questioned me, why are you speaking about the war, Dr. King? Why are you joining the voices of dissent? Peace and civil rights don't mix, they say. But I'm determined to take the gospel seriously. This sermon is not addressed to Hanoi or to the National Liberation Front. It is not addressed to China or to Russia. Neither is it an attempt to overlook the ambiguity of the entire situation. This afternoon, however, I wish not to speak with Hanoi, but rather to my fellow Americans. There is at the outset a very obvious an almost facile connection between the war in Vietnam and the struggle I and others have been waging in America. A few years ago, there was a shining moment in that struggle. It seemed as if there was a real promise of hope for the poor, both black and white, through the poverty program. There were experiments, hopes, and new beginnings. Then came the build-up in Vietnam, and I watched the program broken as if it were some idle political plaything of a society gone mad on war. And I knew that America would never invest the necessary funds or energies in rehabilitation of its poor, so long as adventures like Vietnam continue to draw men and skills and money like some demonic destructive suction tube. You may not know it, my friends, but it is estimated that we spend $500,000 to kill each enemy soldier while we spend only $53 for each person classified as poor. And much of that $53 goes for salaries to people who are not poor. So I was increasingly compelled to see the war as an enemy of the poor, an attack it is such. But the war was doing far more than devastating the hopes of the poor at home. It was sending their sons and their brothers and their husbands to fight and die in extraordinarily high proportion relative to the rest of the population. We were taking the black young men who had been crippled by society and sending them 8,000 miles away to guarantee liberties in Southeast Asia, which they had not found in Southwest Georgia and East Harlem. So we have been repeatedly faced with a cruel irony of watching Negro and white boys on TV screens as they kill and die together for a nation that has been unable to seat them together in the same schoolroom. So we watch them in brutal solidarity, burning the huts of a poor village. And we realize that they would hardly live on the same block in Chicago or Atlanta. I could not be silent. My third reason moves to an even, even deeper level of awareness. For it grows out of my experience in the ghettos of the North over the last three years, especially the last three summers. As I have walked among the desperate, rejected, and angry young men, I have told them that Molotov cocktails and rifles would not solve their problems. I have tried to offer them my deepest compassion while maintaining my conviction that social change comes most meaningfully through nonviolent action. But they're asking, and Rightly so, 
What about Vietnam? They asked if our own nation wasn't using massive doses of violence to solve its problems, to bring about the changes it wanted. Their questions hit home. And I knew that I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, my own government. For the sake of those boys, for the sake of this government, for the sake of the hundreds of thousands trembling under our violence, I could not be solved. There's been a lot of applauding over the last few years. They've applauded our total movement. They've applauded me. <coughs> America and most of its newspapers applauded me in Montgomery when I stood before thousands of Negroes getting ready to ride when my home was bombed, said, we can't do it this way. They applauded us in the sit-in movement when we nonviolently decided to sit in at lunch counters. They applauded us on the freedom rides when we accepted blows without retaliation. They praised us in Albany and Birmingham and in Selma, Alabama. All the press was so noble in its applause and so noble in its praise when I was saying, be nonviolent toward Bull Connor. When I was saying, be nonviolent toward Jim Clark. There's something strangely inconsistent about a nation and a press that will praise you when you say be nonviolent toward Jim Clark, but will curse and damn you when you say be nonviolent toward little brown Vietnamese children. There's something wrong with that press. In 1964, the Nobel Peace Prize was a commission a commission to work harder than I had ever worked before for the brotherhood of man. But even if it were not present, I would yet have to live with the meaning of my commitment to the ministry of Jesus Christ. The good news was meant for all men, for communists and capitalists, for their children and ours, for black and white, for revolutionary and conservative. What then can I say to the Viet Cong or to Castro or to Mayo as a faithful minister to Jesus Christ? Can I threaten them with death? Or must I not share with them my life? My mind goes constantly to the people of that peninsula. They must see Americans as strange liberators. Do you realize that the Vietnamese people declared themselves independent in 1945 after a combined French and Japanese occupation? They were led by Ho Chi Minh. And this is a little known fact. When these people declared themselves independent in 1945, they quoted our Declaration of Independence in their document of freedom. And yet our government refused to recognize President Truman said they were not ready for independence. France then set out to reconquer its former colony. They fought eight long, hard, brutal years. You know who helped France? It was the United States of America. It came to the point where we were meeting more than 80% of the war costs. And even when France started despairing of its reckless actions, we did not. After the French were defeated, it looked as if independence and land reform would come through the Geneva Agreement. But instead, the United States came and started supporting a man named D.M., who turned out to be one of the most ruthless dictators in the history of the world. People were brutally murdered merely because they raised their voices against the brutal policies of D.M. The peasants watched as all this was presided over by United States influence and then by increasing numbers of United States troops to, who came to help quell the insurgencies that DM's methods had aroused. When DM was overthrown, they may have been happy, but the long line of military dictatorship seemed to offer no real change in terms of their need for land and peace. And who are we supporting in Vietnam today? It's a man by the name of General Key who fought with the French against his own people, and who said on one occasion that the greatest hero of his life is Hitler. The press generally won't tell us these things, but God told me to tell you this moment. 
All the while, the people received regular promises of peace and democracy and land reform. Now they languish under our bombs. They watch as we pause in their war, as we kill a million acres of their crops. They see the children, homeless, without clothes, running in packs on the streets like animals. They see the children begging for food. They see the children selling their sisters to our soldiers. This is the role our nation has taken, the role of those who make peaceful revolutions impossible by refusing to give up the privileges and the pledges which come from the immense profits of overseas investments. When machines and computers, profit motives and property rights are considered more important than people, the giant triplets of racism, militarism, and economic exploitation are incapable of being conquered. A true revolution of values will soon look uneasily on the glaring contrast of poverty and wealth. These individuals will look across the seas and see individual capitalists of the West investing huge sums of money in Asia, Africa, and South America only to take the profits out with no concern for the social betterment of the country and say this is not just, and say of war, this way of settling differences is not just. This business of burning human beings with napalm, of filling our nation's homes with orphans and widows, of sending men home from dark and bloody battlefields, physically handicapped and psychologically deranged. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. These are revolutionary times. All over the globe, men are revolting against old systems of exploitation and oppression. The barefoot and shirtless people of the land are rising up as never before. And they are saying, as we say in one of our freedom songs, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Communism is a judgment against our failure to make democracy real. Every nation must now develop an overriding loyalty to mankind as a whole. This calls for a worldwide fellowship, which lifts the neighborly concern beyond one's tribe, race, class, and nation is in reality a call for an all-embracing, unconditional love for all men. This oft-misunderstood and misinterpreted concept, so readily dismissed by the niches of the world as a weak and cowardly force, has now become an absolute necessity for the survival of mankind. When I speak of love, I'm not speaking of some sentimental and weak response. I'm speaking of that force which all of the great religions have seen as the supreme unifying principle of life. Love is somehow the key that unlocks the door which leads to ultimate reality. This Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Buddhist belief about ultimate reality is beautifully summed up in the first epistle of John. Let us love one another, for God is love. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Let me say finally that I oppose the war in Vietnam because I love America. I speak out against this war not in anger, but with anxiety and sorrow in my heart. I speak out against this war because I'm disappointed with America. And there can be no great disappointment where there is no great love. America has strayed away. It's time for all people of conscience to call upon America to come back home. Come home, America. I call on Washington today. I call on every man and woman of goodwill all over America today. I call on the young men of America who must make a choice today to take a stand on this issue. Tomorrow may be too late. Don't let anybody make you think that God chose America as his divine messianic force to be a sort of policeman of the whole world. God has a way of standing before the nations with judgment. And it seems that I can hear God saying to America, you're too arrogant. And if you don't change your ways, I will rise up and break the backbone of your power. And I'll place it in the hands of a nation that doesn't even know my name. Sometimes it isn't easy 
to stand up for truth and for justice. When you tell the truth and take a stand, sometimes it means that you will walk the streets with a burdened heart. Means being abused and scorned. May mean having a seven or eight-year-old child asking you, Daddy, why do you have to go to jail so much? I've long since learned that to be a follower of Jesus Christ means taking up the cross. My Bible tells me that Good Friday comes before Easter. Before the crown we wear, there is the cross that we must bear. Let us bear it. Bear it for truth. Bear it for justice. Bear it for peace. Carl all was right. No lie can live forever. We shall overcome because William Cullen Bryant was right. Truth crust the earth will rise again. We shall overcome because the Bible is right. You shall reap what you sow. With this faith, we will be able to speed up that day when the lion and the lamb will lie down together and every man will sit under his own vine and fig tree and none shall be afraid. Men will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. And nations will not rise up against nations. Neither shall they study war anymore. And I don't know about you, but I ain't going to study war no more. We all think about it. And every now and then I, I think about my own death. <laughs> I think about my own funeral. But I don't think of it in a morbid sense. Every now and then I ask myself, what is it that I would want to say? But I leave the word with you this morning. If any of you around when I have to beat my day, I don't want a long funeral. And if you get somebody to deliver the eulogy, tell them not to talk to me. Every now and then I wonder what I want them to say. Tell them not to mention that I have a Nobel Peace Prize, that isn't important. Tell them not to mention that I have three or four hundred other wars, that's not important. Tell them not to mention where I went to school. I'd like somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like somebody to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. I want you to say on that day that I, I tried to be right on the war question. I want you to be able to see that day that I did try in my life to feed the hungry. I want you to be able to see that day that I did try in my life to clothe the naked. I want you to be able to see that day that I did try in my life to visit those who were in prison. I want you to be able to say that I tried to love and serve humanity. Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major. Say that I was a drum major from righteousness. Say that I was a drum major for truth. I was a drum major for justice. I was a drum major for peace. And all the other shallow things will not matter. I won't have any money to leave behind. I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind. I just want to leave a, a committed life behind. That's all I want to say. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word of song, if I could show somebody he's traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. If I can do my duty as a Christian, Lord, if I can bring salvation to a world once brought, if I can spread the message as the master told, then my living will not be in vain. Yes, Jesus, I want to be on your right or your left side. Not for any selfish reasons. I want to be on his right or his best side. Not in terms of some political kingdom or ambition or another. I just want to be there in love and in justice and in truth and in commitment to others so that we can make of this old world a new world. God bless you. Thank you. Oh.